Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Christian Siem. Uh, very happy to be in Helsinki. Thanks for inviting. We will give an overview of Starship Technologies, a bit about the history, business, uh, mechanics of the robot, electronics, and then uh, software of the robot. It all started about three and a half years ago um, when two of the Skype founders met in London and they wanted to do something uh, great together. And um, one of them was Janusz Fries, uh, another one, Ahti Einla, uh, Estonian co founder of Skype. And they wanted to tackle something huge. And, and they thought that this that there is an industry which is yet not disrupted by um, technology, uh, that the lar possibly the largest industry that is not uh, disrupted by the technology is logistics, which seems to be rather easy. You just move stuff from point A to B. Uh, like, why not? Um, they also had other ideas, for example, building a, a robot helper for homes, doing uh, cleaning and washing dishes and, 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 and clothes and, and, and so on. But they thought that this from point A to B seems to be more simple. And, um, and indeed, um, there is a very simple, like the market is huge, but there is a very simple cost structure like most of the cost of home deliveries is associated with the last mile of that one person walking because of your package because of your food because of your stuff he needs to find your house walk to your place knock do all these things and it takes time it takes 20 minutes um, and 20 minutes in, in, in Helsinki or in London or Silicon Valley of human time just for your for yourself is quite expensive. And, and so it goes that if you're ordering anything like on demand that you want to get it quickly on the same day or, or, or even quicker, then most of the cost is uh, human labor, the guy who brings you uh, the package. They are trying to optimize it, and but this optimization leads to problems uh, in uh, in time. They, pack, they put many of these packages together such that they make one wave in logistics, that the one delivery van goes from house to house that are next to each other. But then this creates these big windows that it's a three hour slot that you have to be at home. People are not at home three hours uh, in London and in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and, and it, it creates other complexities involved. It doesn't, it doesn't, it makes it impossible to do this on-demand local delivery for you. Um, and uh, we are planning to, or we are disrupting it at the moment with this uh, little machine, uh, our robot. Couple of words. So, so, so it is, it is very clear what we are doing. We want to build the world's most efficient on-demand local delivery service. Um, and it's it's very straightforward. And I worked in startups before and I've made some of my own. And quite often the like the biggest issue in Starship is that uh, in, in startups is that you are trying to find the business model. You're trying to find how to create value with your with with your business. Uh, and this is definitely not the case with Starship Technologies. We do know that this need is there, uh, that that people want to do it. For example, more than uh, more than two thousand companies have contacted us that they want to buy our services or buy our robots. Like even before it was ready, two thousand. So it's it's way, like all the companies that you can 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 know, like er everyone has contacted us. Uh, so the need is there, and the business is clear. And the biggest problem is technology. No one has built self-driving machines to public spaces yet. There, if you go out, you, you don't see on sidewalks flying or cars, you don't see stuff moving around on their own. And that's the complexity. It's an engineering, engineering problem. Uh, there are side effects of this as well that it was not initially planned, but, but it does make our, it reduces 
uh, traffic jams, it reduces noise because it, this machine is really quiet, uh, it reduces CO2 emission, uh, some things that we didn't think at all in the beginning, but it seems that local businesses and local communities want this uh, reduce of prices of delivery such that they could compete with Amazon. And there are some elderly people and uh, people think that they can be at home longer and so on. So th there are there are many, many aspects there that uh, actually why people want us and why they are inviting us to their cities and so on. I, I guess it's like a grand, grand scheme or vision of uh, how this kind of innovation transforms future cities. I already mentioned that it is clear we are making, we want to make it most efficient, but exactly how is the business model? We are delivering stuff. Uh, it can be fast food or packages or, or we are actually delivering medicine and flowers as well already at the moment. Um, it's, it is meant actually local and on demand. So it is like half an hour, a uh, couple of miles. And it is pay as you go or service that you actually order with API uh, that from that point to that point and our clients are big businesses like Domino's uh, for example or Swiss Post and then we deliver to their clients. To sum it up where we are at the moment as a, as a business so it was founded by uh, Skype co-founders Oh, I didn't, I didn't correct the slide, sorry. Actually, now we have already 200 employees. So uh, I, was, I joined uh, the company a year and a half ago and I was employee number 21. Uh, and now a year and a half later, we have 200 employees. So, so we are expanding rapidly and it is like a proper business now. It isn't anymore a recent development project. Um, we we are definite leaders of uh, automatic delivery, and uh, and there are many other companies, ground-based uh, delivery companies. There are at least twenty out there who are trying to do the same thing, but uh, uh, we are far ahead. It's an important thing that we are actually doing business at the moment every day. We have more than hundred robots. They're delivering packages to real clients every day, all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's important. And, and, and they're doing it all over the world. They're doing it uh, in London, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, in Germany, a couple of places. Now we are going to Netherlands and so on. And all the research and development, production, maintenance, everything related to software, hardware, electronics, everything is done in Tallinn. So 100% of the engineering is done in Tallinn, uh, but operations worldwide. We are not in Helsinki yet, <laughs> although I was walking around and I think it's a perfect place, like wide sidewalks, uh, uh, high living standard, high salaries, um, I, I guess. We should, we should think about it <laughs> and come here as quickly as possible. Okay, our, our, our main superstar. You can see that the color of our lead has changed. Um, Sim will talk about it more, how we are developing and involving our product. But just a quick overview. Hmm. But this, this machine is called in official legal texts uh, a personal delivery device. So we are legal in uh, four countries, four states in America, and we are legal in uh, in Estonia as well. Uh, so we can drive anywhere we want uh, by the law approved by parliament and stay for states and it's in a process or in other countries. And in all these English speaking countries, it is called personal delivery device. I already mentioned that it drives on sidewalks. So it is driving with maximum speed of six kilometers per hour, the same as humans are walking. It has, that's a crucial, crucial line for us that we are actually scaling up the production at the moment, which means that it must make sense business-wise. And in order to make, make sense business-wise, it must be really cheap. So we are, this is the sensors that we are using. We are using nine cameras, four radars, 
and eight ultrasonic sensors. All of it together costs tiny amount of money, like less than 200 euros. Um, and and compared to the self-driving cars, for example, in Google self-driving cars, you can see these point clouds of lidars. Uh, they have three lidars, which cost about 45,000, only one type of sensor. Uh, and and, and our, all sensors cost 200, which is like uh, almost two orders of magnitude difference. Um, and it is important, when, like logistics is a low margin business in order to scale, it cannot cost more. Um, a crucial thing again, we need to know where we are. Uh, I'll show some uh, how the software works and how, how we are doing it. Another very important thing, which why we can be so cheap and why we can scale already the business at the moment is that we are not making the machines 100% self-driving. They only need to know that now they don't understand anymore where they are, or they don't understand the social situation or something is too <coughs> complex, then they will give control to the human operators. And humans are solving the most complex situations on the computer screen, uh, clicking where the robot needs to move and interacting with people, understanding social situations, uh, uh, complex traffic situations, whatever. And, uh, and without this, it would be impossible with this hardware and this computational resources that we have at the moment. Um, but with human operators, then we only need to solve 90% of the most easiest cases. And the easiest cases usually are you're just alone driving on a simple sidewalk. And that we can solve, or we have solved. It carries about 10 kilograms, and, um, and it is it is smart, safe, cute and small animal. Um, the, um, the question was, how do we make sure that no one steals it? Uh, we, have, we have never thought that it is an issue because it just doesn't make sense. This thing doesn't cost anything uh, and uh, so it, and it is most well-connected device that you have on public roads. So whenever you approach it, you are on, on a movie, whenever you lift it up, it automatically calls to the police. Uh, whenever you move it somewhere, it knows where it is. Uh, and, and it doesn't, and you don't gain anything from there. Maybe two hamburgers and the Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. So 10 euros, uh, so it just doesn't make sense. Stealing of it is not the rational thing to do. Um, it's easier to steal motorbikes or, or destroy windows of, of shops or whatever. It's just it's just too heavily, too cheap and too well connected. Uh, so this is not an issue, and we know it from practice as well. We have driven eighty thousand kilometers. We have we have crowed, uh, crossed a car road one million times. We are driving like everywhere all the time, and it has never been an issue. So this is this is not not a problem. What is a problem? Problem might be vandalism. That you don't want to gain profit, but you just want to kind of throw stones or do some harm to it. Uh, this is a problem, but we can bypass it by choosing better cities, better countries, uh, better areas in these cities, better streets on that city. And, and so in places where we are driving, we mostly don't have any problems with vandalism as well. Uh, Uh, usually laptops are not done on delivery, but I mean, it doesn't change the fact with a look with a usual delivery as well. There is even mo more risk because there is a person kind of doing this delivery. Uh, I mean, it is about the same business as usual and you don't know where are the laptops. Um, let's, uh, I'm gonna uh, c give it over to you. Oh, I'm gonna give it over to Sim now. He will do, uh, talk about um, mechanics of the robot and then I will talk about software and then later we will have plenty of time for questions as well. So hi and um, my name is uh, Seem and uh, I'm working on the physical side of the robot. So basically uh, like Christian and his team and other software guys would have a robot, uh, something physical that can interact with the world. 
And uh, today I'm going to share with you a little bit of our philosophies of uh, how we are designing the, the robot, so the, the product development side. And uh, f firstly, uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, telling you that uh, yeah, we, we have been in, uh, developing uh, quite hard for the last few we last months at uh, Starship to make the robot more scalable, cheaper, and make it something which is uh, even maybe nice, uh, nicer looking. And uh, so today you are going to see the newest uh, robot that we, we have. Yeah, actually, this is not the robot. This robot is there on the, on the stage. But, uh, but this is something that I would like to start with. So I would like to tell you the story of how uh, Starship uh, started in the beginning. And as also Christian mentioned, we have been grounded uh, by uh, people from Skype. So meaning that we didn't have any the same struggles that a lot of startups have uh, finding the finances and so on. But the thing is, we are still but as also our CEO likes to say, how much money you have, how good, uh, good uh, people you have, and so on, how good idea you have. You always start from, uh, you start, always start from like a garage. You, you start simply and you start uh, building up the product. So in the beginning we had just a small room. Uh, we, we even had to take turns uh, to fit in the people. And uh, inside, uh, it, it looked at the robot like this, uh, as it on the picture. So it was just an electronics platform to, to start testing out uh, different, uh, first, uh, like the algorithms and also the laying grounds to the, the electronics and everything that we are having now. So we were moving stage by stage to the direction that we are at the moment. So after a while, we already knew that we want to have six wheels because the six wheels is uh, giving us the capability of climbing the curb stones. And uh, moreover, it can also uh, handle rough terrains a little bit better. But uh, so we were going further and further with the design. At some point, we already had a very simple and temporary, uh, temporary uh, body. At that time also, even though we were really in a stealth mode and we were in a stealth um, uh, almost what, a, one and a half years, uh, with this kind of robot we were driving around already because we were in the university campus and uh, it was not risky that anybody can figure out what we are doing there. But when, so we, at some point we were getting closer and uh, having uh, some kind of uh, robot which is, looks very close to what we have today. So we have industrial designers helping us to make it uh, nicer and better looking. So the, the picture there is a robot that is 3D printed out to get the feeling of how it is, uh, how it feels and how it will look like. But there was also a problem at that moment when we were getting close uh, to see how it looks like. We had to become creative how we are doing the, the testing outside. And uh, so we are doing this kind of test outside. So it was still in the time when we were in stealth mode. But now, uh, yeah, so now the robot looks like this. So this, uh, this is the work of uh, three, uh, three years and a little bit more. So, and this is exactly the robot that you have on the stage also. So this robot uh, has been started producing now uh, last month, at the beginning of the month, it started uh, produced in the, our production. And this is uh, now a model that we can uh, really scale up and uh, and we can really start uh, rolling it out when necessary. But basically, the moral of the story that if you have a company like, especially like this kind of hardware company, you have to go through all the stages. And here on, on the picture, you can see from the right to topwards up till the down all the kind of pr prototypes that we were uh, were having. Also, the first uh, prototype that you see on the wooden one, it was just one concept that we were trying out how how it would work. So uh, let's uh, move on now a little bit of sharing a little bit of the design principles that we have. And our principle is to be fast and we need to be fast. As also Christian mentioned, we have at the moment uh, 20 uh, different uh, companies uh, who are popping out and want to compete with us. Uh, a lot of them also from China. So this is something that we need to be fast. But we also, we are in a really new field. So it is also the software wise, it has to connect with the, the mechanic side of the product development, meaning that we need to test all the time and see, uh, make it fast. If you make mistakes, uh, then we can fix it and try it again. 
so at the moment we are in a stage where we are smaller changes we are going to have like one week uh, we go to the manufacturing if it is a little bit bigger project for example in this uh, case we, we have already injection molded parts which is a little bit uh, higher volume things it, this uh, big project take uh, up to six months but if you look into the industry like this uh, we are really uh, go going and pushing fast but, but there is a the problem with it we are taking a lot of risks with that but this is all calculated risks but this kind of calculated risks also we are tackling by, by uh, for some modularity that I'm going to talk about next slide. But also we need to keep the thing simple, and simple also is cheap. Uh, we need to be competitive uh, by keeping it simple and cheap. Another thing which is also talked about in the in the in the new age at the moment is the 3D printing. And the 3D printing is something which is really transforming the, the industry at the moment. It's, it's uh, before it has been only to really prototype, to really see if things fit together and then you just toss it away and you pro produce it in a proper way, like old way. But nowadays we have got to the, the, the stage where the 3D printing can be used in the real manufacturing if you don't have extremely high volumes. And when we really want to be fast and the, to, to switch the different solutions, uh, we are keeping quite a few parts inside the robot in 3D printed parts. And if the parts are less than five euros of cost, you need to have quite high volumes in order to, to justify going into the injection molding or different kind of uh, uh, solutions. And another, another thing to keep also re us fast and to be able to orient us uh, even if it's necessary is even that the injection molding, which is for high volume production, we are still in like a half, a half step. So this is uh, aluminum molds. So if the people are, are there any mechanical background people also in this stage at the moment here, in the crowd here? No? No. But anyway, so uh, aluminum, uh, uh, um, if you would go to like a regular people, uh, like old industry, saying that we are doing some kind of uh, high volume production, aluminium it doesn't sound good. It's steel, which is uh, which uh, is the the main word for there. But uh, what it does allow for us is to have really high. We can change the molds. We can change the really th things fast if necessary. So, but let's talk about the modularity that I also mentioned a little bit. So, the, our robot here uh, is. Uh, built up to be as modular as possible. So on a, on a picture there, you can see uh, just uh, some of the models. It also, it co continues inside. So all the, the panels we have, in a sense, modular that we can change things if we need to, without uh, impacting things around it. And what it does it give us? It, it does give us easy to redesign. It gives us uh, so we can make new new features into the robot if necessary. Uh, but it's also, it gives us the, the simple serviceability. So this is something that we mentioned last slide, that if we have made a mistake and we need to fix something, then we can just replace this part and, and make it uh, better again. And in the future, it will be also really good to have the configurability. For example, the basket inside that you can see, we can start having different kind of solutions there. We can have uh, uh, refrigerated solutions. We can have different kind of uh, things that we are also uh, working on at the moment and thinking about the applications. So no another thing here is, uh, as also Christian mentioned, our robots are really well connected. But besides that, we have also a really good data from it. And this is something where I'm coming from before, is, it was industrial robots. So it's like the, the orange robots that are putting the cars together in the factories. We were dreaming of having this kind of possibility as we do have it at the moment. There we were selling the robots away for the customers and we didn't have any, any feedback how the robots were really used. But at the moment we are owning the robots. We are just providing the service, meaning that we have full data of the, how the, the robots are on the streets. Uh, and we have 20 times per second we have robots uh, pushing the data into the, into the cloud. And why, why is it good? We can really start optimizing the, the design. We can really see how it is done. But even more lucrative is having the possibility to do the predictive maintenance. And this is something now where we start getting also into the grounds what you guys are doing. And it is about machine learning. 
And this is just one example, and uh, we have really a lot of room to improve on this area. But uh, on this picture there, you can see how uh, the motor currents are drifting apart from the, on the robot. So, and the cause of that in the end was that the flat there was a flat tire, meaning that there was one side of the robot was driving a little bit more. But this is something that was in the picture, you can see it took almost uh, 200 kilometers for us driving on the streets to, to find out that there's something is off. But if we have a good data model, uh, we, we can predict this kind of issues. And this is something that we are really working on now. So, so in, in the in the telemetry, we have all the information about voltages. We have the information about currents, microphones. We can use for a different kind of uh, feedback of how the, the robots are making sounds, temperatures, how much uh, the leads things are closed, open closed. So we have all the data that it is uh, necessary. So I will go back to to Christian now. Mm, I guess uh, I guess we some some people think that uh, inside this world that we are a logistics company or maybe a robotics company but if we count number of different types of people working in the company or the background of our people then then may, mainly we are a software company uh, most of the people most of the engineers are making the robot smart and 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 I guess it is uh, it's of course arguable, but it is it is making an artificially intelligent machine to public spaces. This this thing must be smart. It must be able to drive where where all the cars are, where all the people are, all the with all the complexities. So we are making something that is intelligent, and. Um, and I'm going to talk about this inside architecture of the robot, like how, what are the modalities there? What are these parts of software that we, how this thing is kind of composed of? Um, and my background is in machine learning as well. Uh, uh, and in AI, I was, I was working before joining the startup. I was working in London doing deep neural networks and finishing my PhD in machine learning and so on. And, and it is the same for like half of the software engineers that it is about building this stuff that is intelligent. The problem is that it is, it's rather complex. In the robot, there are about 50 programs talking to each other asynchronously, just sending messages from one uh, program to another. And then the behavior emerges from there, like, like, and and it is kind quite difficult to explain it. It takes months to understand it at all if you join the company. Uh, like, what's going on? It usually takes about four months before you can write your first productive line of code. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, how many of you are doing software development or have written any code? Uh, Okay, good. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> almost all, <laughs> almost all of you. Good. Uh, so, okay, good, good. Uh, <laughs> we were going over the names and uh, uh, who are coming and the companies, and then we weren't sure that actually like half of the people have written code. But good, good. So it is a bit complex. This is my simplification. If you would ask from anyone else in the company, you would get a different type of simplification of the robot. Uh, I understand the robot like this: that there are four main components. Top one is localization. Robot needs to know where it is. A left one is routing. It needs to know where to go. Uh, right one, it needs to know everything that is around it, the robot. Traffic lights, people, cars, and so on. And if you know where to go, where you are, and what's around you, then you can make decisions where to go. Um, and uh, and and it is it is more classical than the modern cool fancy uh, deep reinforcement learning things where everything is meshed up into one neural network. It's not like this. It is quite often quite classical. Many parts of these are classical computer uh, computer science algorithms. I'm going to talk about all these uh, four and then some uh, more aspects. So first, uh, left one, the planning from where to go. It turns out that, that, that we can, as a company, choose 
countries where to go, cities where to go, areas in the city where to go. And we are doing this, uh, this choosing based on the data. So we have uh, not billions of deliveries, virtual deliveries, but trillions of virtual deliveries done on Amazon Cloud. So we are making these virtual deliveries and testing out how dangerous it would be to drive there, how uh, fast it would be drive, uh, drive there and so on. So we have models for every sidewalk, for every road crossing. We have mathematical models where we are predicting how good we would be on these roads. And then we can do it for all the cities and, and, and countries all over the world and we are doing it so we can choose the best areas. And then best countries, best cities, best areas. And now if you're doing the operation, we can actually use the same modeling and same tools in order to choose routes. Because in cities quite often you can actually choose a route, whether you go from here or you go from here to this other point. And it turns out that they are very different, up to order of magnitude difference in, in safety. Uh, uh, if you're choosing the route correctly. Um, that's one part, like choosing areas and choosing routes from point A to B. And we use open street maps and all the traffic light information, cafes, uh, average population density estimates. So we are putting all the information together that we can get from the world. And then later, if you're already driving there or our internal information as well. So we are getting better in estimating the routes later as well from time to time. We can know our average speeds and our average number of cars and so on. Localization. Uh, I think we have a, about already 15 patents uh, applications sent and most of them come from the localization. So it turns, that turns out that if you want to understand where you are, then GPS is quite noisy in cities because there are high buildings and all these obstructions. And if you use cheap sensors that everything must be cheap in a robot, then you are off by three meters on average, but we need an accuracy of a couple of centimeters or 10 centimeters in order not to be on a car road versus on a sidewalk, which would be like uh, quite bad uh, uh, to be on a car road accidentally. So what we are doing, we are using uh, two dimensional lines, uh, which are the most simple mathematical objects. On e from each of the nine cameras, we are taking edges, uh, just two dimensional edges. And we are seeing, for example, an edge of this pole. Uh, from one place, then we know from other sensors, from motors and from gyroscope and from everything that they're moving, for example, a meter. And then we are seeing another, the same edge from another localization. So we are doing, we are driving like this every time, first time in the city, first time if there is a new place where we haven't been before, human drives it. And then all these lines or edges are uploaded to the server with all the other information. And then the three dimensional map is created from these lines on uh, on a three-dimensional space. So if I saw that line there and now I'm meter ahead and I'm seeing it there, then I can triang triangulate this location of this edge in three-dimensional space. And at each point of time, we are seeing about 500 or 1,000 lines in city environment. And then we use this thing offline to create the map slam is the algorithm uh, uh, of these uh, lines. And then that's our map. and. Um, yeah, and then we, if we are there next time, then we can already match a, us against these lines. We are again seeing a line there and line there, and now we can find the most probable location uh, for ourselves against that map that we have created offline. And with this, we are getting a couple of centimeter accuracy localization, of course, together with GPS and everything. Um, I'm head of computer vision and perception. Uh, I think I, I, it's one of the largest teams in the company, and it's um, it's the worst team as well. That uh, in many ways, for example, whenever we are having an accident with a car or any other problem, then I have to report it on a weekly meeting to the company. Why didn't we see the car, or why did we have this problem accident? We we need to understand everything that is around us that is changing, and uh, and that yeah. And then we are doing it in various ways. Uh, for example, these points there, this is a, a, a three-dimensional understanding around the robot. We are using uh, stereo cameras, three pairs of stereo cameras in front, inside, and side, and they are like human eyes two cameras and then you're finding similar patterns from one camera and another camera and then you can again triangulate 
the pixel position in three-dimensional space. And then you can see this three-dimensional world. Of course, getting this image was easy compared to the rest of the 90% of the work was getting this image also when there was sun, rain, snow, scratches, fog, moisture and so on like it must work with all these uh, like problems in the real world as well and 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 we are kind of good at it we can understand all the things uh, uh, around us this one as uh, meter is one one square is one meter and this is a car there and another car like five meters away and about eight meters away and we can understand it and we are quite smooth and we are driving ourselves and together with localization we can actually do it so we are driving autonomously quite decently on sidewalks and and it is working um, but there is a problem. The range of that stuff is only five, 10 meters. But if you're crossing a car road, then the cars are a bit further away and they are driving faster and they're kind of, we need more. Um, so how do you get the cars? Like the initial plan was in a company that uh, all the road crossings would be made by human operators. So we don't need to detect cars. They will make correct decisions. But it turns out that because they have a low resolution image delay in video feed and compression artifacts, then they're making mistakes too often. They cannot see the car. It's just not humanly possible. And then we still need to uh, understand the cars ourselves on a robot as well. And this is more problematic. This is one example algorithm. We are detecting pairs of uh, lights from the car, uh, from the, all the cars. Then we have uh, top down left. We are have radar measurements. We know the speed of our directional speed of objects on some area. So we know we don't know how far they are, where they are, but we know that there are some objects with that speed uh, in that area. And then we have from open street maps, we have a structure of car roads. This white small dot there is a robot and it's a left side. And then you can see the cars. One square is now uh, five meters. So this car is about 15 meters away. And then it's again, lots of heavy mathematics. Uh, we are making hypothesis that the car is moving from here to here. And then we know that if the car is moving from here to here, then the headlight should be here, the radar speed should be this, and so on. And then now we can adjust the hypothesis, taking a derivative with respect to all these uh, input signals. And then we are adjusting the hypothesis that we are finding the best match. And then we know where is the car, what's the best hypothesis for the car such that it will coincide with all the incoming data. And it's quite heavy mathematical models, some analytical derivatives and so on to find these best hypotheses. And you can see that the car is the blue one there. Uh, with these four frames, it moves like three meters uh, there. And it does work. Problem with this particular stuff is that it works at nighttime the best because we cannot get the precise headlights. Um, we need to do it on daytime as well. Um, and for that, we are using uh, uh, deep learning as well. We are using deep neural networks for you. As, as, our, as our resources are limited and we need to do everything in a computer. Uh, and we are using NVIDIA's Tegra TK1, which is the smallest possible uh, com uh, computer with a, a graphical processing unit. So our models are tiny. Uh, we are using YOLO, you only look once uh, 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 model, but we have developed it way further and optimized it and, and uh, done all the things. And so we can actually detect the cars, approximate locations of them, directions of cars, types of them and so on. And then on top of it, we can only do this four frames per second uh, because uh, deep learning is very, very, very expensive. Even if you take the cheapest model possible, it's, uh, the model is 100 times faster than state of the art is, like if you take a ResNet or, or anything like this. Um, so it is like two orders of magnitude faster, but uh, so, but it's still only four FPS. And then on other frames, we are doing classical computer vision tracking on top of it. And then again, fusing it together with uh, radars and, and car roads and everything in order to get make sense of this uh, incoming cars. 
Okay, so I, I mentioned like four main topics or things there about routing and planning of routes and choosing areas, about localization with lines and, and can actually lots of heavy mathematics, and then understanding around us, nearby stuff, far away cars, and then we are putting these decisions together uh, uh, with more, again, classical computer vision things and also deep learning here and other things. Um, we are driving a lot. We are driving, I mentioned already before, that we have done, for example, more than a million road crossings. And if you do a million road crossings, then bad stuff happens, even if you're really good uh, at it. And um, But we need to be better. We need to kind of understand more, understand faster, be av faster on average and so on. And we always need uh, good people as well or good collaborations so if uh, if you have a company and want to collaborate with us then let us know and if you want to come to Tallinn and work for Starship then let us know as well and uh, and we will definitely or our current 50 engineers and all the ones we are joining it's it's like 100% hard work of making it smarter and smarter such that it would be safe and fast uh, and 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 we are almost there and then we are assuming that the product will be ready like in end of this year January and then we could start proper scaling in thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands thank you Yeah, so very um, dumb question. So how do you deliver to a, a high-rise building? <laughs> uh, we don't. Uh, it's only meant for, you have to then come out if you want to be delivered it there. But it turns out that most people actually in Silicon Valley, in Toronto, uh, in London suburbs are uh, living in uh, semi-detached houses or that they live in houses. So it's actually not a problem for these people who are doing on-demand expensive deliveries that they actually don't live in block of flats quite often. So we have enough market uh, in these things. But you can, of course, order it and then you need to go, come down. And in the future, far future, probably there can be lifts and things and we can communicate with the cities and, and it is possible. We can do indoor stuff as well. We can localize indoor as well, but it's, it's not needed at the moment. We have enough to do uh, with usual houses. And also one thing to maybe <clears throat> uh, mention is that we are not really competing also with people. So a lot of people are concerned that we are like robots and everything is stealing, stealing the, the jobs. But this is something that we don't see it at all. And this is something at the moment we are not competing with uh, this kind of deliveries who can go the high raises. And if people are really willing to pay a premium and extra for that, then they can do it. So we are going to be really some kind of, you have to go down, but you also don't need to pay as much as the, the people who are coming down, I mean, up the stairs for you. Question. Yes, there are many hi. questions. Absolutely a fantastic story you guys have. So one question, you said that there are 20 other or many other competitors coming. Are there any regulatory issues that now starting to pop up because of the safety issues? Example, you had a robot just, let's say, goes front of the school bus and, and then it may cause mm -hmm. issues like Google Cars they have right now. I think uh, the answer is at the moment very clear that we are extremely well received uh, by politicians and by countries. So in America, we have made completely legal without anyone needing to be near the robot in four states already and giving us like all proper rights uh, to be there. And same in Estonia. And it seems that all of the, like most countries, most cities really do want us there. And it was a, like, a, we were afraid in the beginning, like I wasn't there yet by then, but uh, three years ago, they were afraid that maybe it could be a potential issue of this startup, but it hasn't been. It's going very smoothly and, uh, and it's very well received. And I guess one main reason is that it is inherently safe. The six kilometers per hour, like small, tiny, even in full speed crashing into a child, nothing happens. No, I mean, it's the other way. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bus has to... Uh, yeah, sure, 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 sure. But I guess, yeah, that's with the people as well. And uh, so far, it hasn't been a problem. Um, okay, uh, approximately cost of the robotic car. So, <coughs> at the moment, uh, we are not going to sell uh, the robot, uh, but we are. Uh, our goal is to have uh, one euro, one dollar for, per delivery. So this means that it is a couple of kilometers uh, of deliveries. The cost will go. So the cost. Or oh, you meant the robot? 
production of robot. Yeah, but this is something that at the moment uh, we are not really telling that the price. I think I am telling usually. <laughs> <laughs> I am usually telling and I'm going to tell here as well. At the moment, it's about 6,000 and we want to uh, <laughs> reduce it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it is tiny, like uh, 6,000. It's yeah, but then our end goal is to, to achieve 2,000 or uh, 3,000. Or even less. Th thanks, guys. Great story, great presentation, and I, I, I love the reaction of the kind of like random bystander when, when the car hit your robot. Unfortunately, that it wasn't the random bystander. Ah, okay. <laughs> because I, I, I was happy to uh, see that. So okay, somebody hit. But because we are changing the software absolutely every day, and and uh, in Tallinn uh, and in most places at the moment, quite often we have these people who walk next to it. They n do not do any driving. Uh, they just have a one button. They can stop the robot. And this stop signal is one of the most important signals for us to do the learning as well. So we are going, we are doing stuff in heavy areas where we shouldn't operate yet. But because we have these people who walk next to it, we can do the learning faster. We also are doing the driving and deliveries, uh, real deliveries without these people as well. But these are in the areas where there are less cars and less uh, less things moving around. In heavy areas, people are still around it because we want to learn faster. Okay, thanks for the clarification. It would have been called. But, but the question was that uh, you said that you are you are a software company. So how do you see your future in in three to five years? Are you going to build the robots or are you going to sell the software? Because I neither of them. We are a service company selling a service, moving stuff from point A to B. So you don't see any kind of like spin off of actually. No. Okay. Cool. Thanks. We can sell also data that we are gathering and knowledge that we are getting about the city. But still, then we are selling data, but not yeah. robots, not I'm software. That that is one of our more. Yes, it remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, thank you for the great presentation. It was super nice. Uh, how do you think robot can cope with the snow? So what if it gets stuck? Can you also allow people to help robot or to take it out and <laughs> put to some other better surface? Thank you. Yeah, so our robots uh, have been driving in snow. So in Estonia, we have the same kind of uh, weather as you have it here in, in uh, Finland. So, and we haven't had too many issues with the snow. So in general, we have a, basically we have a six drive uh, uh, robot, so six wheel drive robot. So it, it can handle much more than you can imagine in the beginning. But also, if it would happen, like there has been really just a fresh snowfall and uh, we would somehow get stuck, uh, we have also speakers on our uh, robots. So it is possible to ask help also if it's necessary. But, but at the moment, uh, our robots are, have been really reliable also in, in the snow. And even if they wouldn't, then actually it doesn't change the business. Most of the world lives without snow. And uh, like um, our, our countries at the moment where we operate, like uh, Switzerland, Germany, England, uh, Silicon Valley, Washington DC, and all these places, they actually they don't have snow. But we can drive in snow, so we can still come <laughs> to Helsinki as well. Thanks, guys. Very inspiring and really cool stuff you're working with. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the business model. So, so how how are you doing it now? How do you do you make the deals with the local retailers, and how do you plan to scale up your business model going when you're moving up, moving to this really service company, yeah. moving stuff from uh, point A to B? At the moment, we don't do it so much with very small local uh, businesses. So our clients are mainly big companies. Most of the companies are delivering about million things a day. Uh, for example, our uh, uh, clients are Domino Pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Just Eat, Swiss Post. Uh, so huge companies which are delivering million things a day, and and we are uh, our they are our clients, and we are doing these pilot 
cooperations in cities and delivering to their real clients. So, uh, so more like dedicated robots per clients rather than areas? Uh, we are trying, no, actually not. We are trying to choose clients such that we can use many clients in the same area. So the same robot still serves these a couple of our partners. Uh, but I guess because it is mainly about learning at the moment, maybe they, doing the user experience right, doing the uh, communication with the client right, uh, all the other things, and we are not there yet to, to, to use cheaply either. So it's mainly about learning. But in the end, we are already at the moment doing it like this, that in one area we have agreements with many different big companies and we are delivering stuff uh, uh, to them. And then, uh, the more into the future we are going, the more smaller uh, companies can join in. And who knows, maybe usual citizens in the end as well, they can order from point A to B, but this will be the uh, first away call. And uh, we didn't really mention uh, at the moment in this uh, presentation, uh, but we have different concepts that we are also working on. And uh, one of the concepts is uh, called HAP uh, concept, that we have an automated uh, warehouse which is uh, placed in the small area where, uh, for example, some kind of big truck can come and dump all the packages there or things are stored there. It would be automated and we put it into the robot and the robot will drive out. But there are a lot of different concepts that we are working on. And, uh, but this is one of them. And exactly, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and we have other things which are kind of more what we are doing at the moment already as well. For example, we have a collaboration with Mercedes-Benz, who was the lead uh, investor in the last round that we had in January. Um, uh, and they, with them, they built this uh, van where eight robots are in the van and this van stops and then some robots go out and then it stops in other place. Some go in and some go out and so on. This is in, we are using it every day, delivering like 50 packages in Estonia with this system as well. Uh, so there are many extensions there and we have some things are almost production ready as well. Like, uh, for example, swapping a battery for a robot and all these swapping a basket inside of a battery. So actually the business is a bit wider and more in scope than we were explaining in here. All these other things are less AI as well. It's more, it's more usual automatic uh, uh, logistics and robotics. This is the most artificial intelligent uh, stuff uh, there is. Uh, yes, uh, thank you guys for the presentation, really inspirational. Um, I can't resist asking now that we have Seam from mechanical background and Christian from the software background, which one do you see as the harder problem for you? Or which one is the bottleneck at the moment, hardware or software? I can answer because otherwise it uh, seems like Christian is bragging. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it is definitely. I mean, I also have a mechatronics background, so it's uh, knows a lot of our guys. We 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 have a little bit of understanding, so it's. Uh, I, I definitely say it is uh, that this part where there's Christian is working, and also all the artificial intelligence. I mean, we we, we uh, for mechanical side we have uh, challenges of as I mentioned also being fast and this kind of things, which is uh, not uh, very uh, traditional industry is not really used to it. But otherwise, uh, really to 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 make us uh, f make it or fail it, it is uh, their side. Um, yes, I I must agree. Like from numbers as well, if we take the current cost of delivery that we are doing as a business, then most of the business is in areas where there is lots of traffic, lots of people, lots of bicycles, lots of cars. And the biggest problem there is safety. Uh, so we're colliding with bicycles, people and cars. Uh, and uh, because of that, we have this person who walks next to you, next to the robot and presses stop buttons. Uh, because we want to operate where there is lots of uh, packages and stuff. We want to be in, in prime areas. And to get rid of this person, this person is like 80% of the cost at the moment. Uh, so if we could get rid of that person, our actual delivery cost at the moment, which is huge, like huge, huge, uh, would drop uh, five times. And uh, in order to do it, uh, it is the software, it is the uh, safety, not crashing with stuff. And uh, in order to do it, it's, it is software mainly by people because this thing needs to be cheap as well. Uh, otherwise, we could solve it more easily with electronics and sensors. But of course, it is sensors as well and electronics, which is not mentioned too much here. We are developing all the sensors ourselves as well, all the controllers for the sensors and everything. So this part is important as well. But then it's still mainly software and we are mainly employing software people at the moment. That actually makes sense. 
I wonder if it would be a, another way around if you would be like the last 50 miles delivering in the for example the Finnish countryside but where there's very little very few people very little traffic and but, maybe the roads are not so good yeah but then you would uh, need to do already self-driving cars and this is another not too trivial problem either hi uh, I could answer this uh, one question more. I think it is more related to hardware and electronics in flying drones. Uh, there is a company who's got about 100 employees as well and about 15, 20 million of funding, about similar as we are, uh, and they are doing drones and 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 they are in weekly meetings. They are uh, their main KPI is a mean distance between uh, crashes of drones, and this crash happens then because of hardware, electronics, or software failure. And there, it might be that the role of hardware were a uh, bit bigger and in some sense it is easier to fly uh, it might be that in them they have actually more hardware engineers and electronics engineers but I, i'm not sure yeah uh, is any of the code that you write open source or available <laughs> as white papers or something like that uh, no, and it is just hugely complex mess uh, of, of 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 stuff, and it's it's crazy. Uh, like we don't have any documentation, we don't have any unit tests. It's just a <laughs> it's just a mess of stuff. We are changing the hardware, then we are throwing away most of the code. Everything is extremely tightly coupled with electronics and hardware with each other. It, it, it's just. Ex impossible to outsource output anything meaningful for anyone else from there uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation <laughs> and i have uh, one uh, question which is about the competitors are there already uh, similar robots out there and the other is a bit random given the name i expected a spacey company can you explain where does the name come from Maybe one answer the competition. Yeah. Comp so, so I will answer the, the competition. So we, at the moment, we have uh, around 20 companies which are, which are uh, competing with us. Maybe the more uh, more notable are in the US, there are uh, two companies at the moment. There's also one Italian company uh, producing the Vespa, uh, Vespa motorcycles. They are also one of the competitors. And then also we have in China, three three big companies who are like uh, Alibaba is uh, building their own and so so there are other few uh, companies uh, big ones who are also tackling this problem we, but also this is something which is good for us because uh, it shows that uh, we are on the right track if there wasn't any co competitors they'd be doing wrong thing and I would say that none of the competitors have more than three robots so uh, and we are the only ones who are even thinking about scaling up the production. And uh, usually the price of the robots is about 10 times higher as well at the moment because they are in research and development phase still. Oh, second question as well. Um, oh, the name. Uh, the name, uh, if you are a software person, then the name was uh, created by a software. Uh, so we, our founder created this Python script that combined uh, two words together with some rules and then produced a huge uh, list of uh, words. And then uh, they deleted some of them by hand. And then there was some voting and the best came from his software. And, uh, and Starship, uh, I mean, shipping in logistics makes some sense and star is a small thing and there are some resembling like it does make sense somehow somehow let's have a few questions more there was one here so are you reusing some of the data that you've collected for training later or oh, of course <laughs> I mean that's the main thing with you uh, absolutely every engineer in my team third of the time of their like what they do is about data science they structure data they annotate it they 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 query the data they analyze it because you need to know what this intelligent system does like why did it behave wrongly where does it behave wrongly most of it comes out statistically so it's all about data and data analysis and all our models come from our real data so all the images that we'll collect we have uh, for example we have a dedicated team in africa 12 people there who are just annotating all the time. We use Mechanical Turk, uh, we use unsupervised learning all the time, like all only data and only learning from data and, and, start, uh, and uh, using data for doing next decisions. 
for example, we have uh, a, a small data set of 100 million high resolution images that these things have co collected. I think we have gone through these things with different neural networks at least 10 times these 100 millions to, to find specific images that we need and then annotate them again and then use them in other learnings and so on. Hundreds of servers doing it all the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, very interesting. I have actually background in autonomous robot research, very cool. so very cool to see after 15 years something coming out in the products. So, uh, how how do you see, like, how you have structured the actual reasoning ar architecture? Is it like kind of monolithic code or se several self? Uh, kind of independent mm -hmm. decision processes, mm -hmm. for example, for collision avoidance and so on. We are, uh, it's running on Ubuntu uh, uh, operating system. On top of it, there is a ROS roboting operating system, which is an open source uh, project. And this is the framework we are using. The idea is that you have independent uh, programs running there and they are communicating with predefined messages. And these messages also are saved what we need into their uh, data container and we can later replay them. This architecture is itself modular in a sense that it is like small, maybe like these modern world is these restless API things that they kind of uh, microservices that they are communicating with each other and uh, uh, and learning about it. So I would say that it is tiny modular programs that are communicating with each other with predefined uh, messages. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for coming to AI Helsinki Starship. Another round of applause. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>